Hey guys, my name is Jafon and I'm from Brooklyn. Valentine's Day is this Sunday, so we're giving a batch of our tastiest treats to one lucky fan. All you have to do to win is follow at bakedbybella underscore and at Real Fans Real Talk on IG and send us a screenshot once it's done and you'll be automatically entered. The winner will be picked Saturday at 7 p.m. and announced on IG Live. Thanks and happy Valentine's Day. A different type of blend Backing up Misfit To make sure y'all tuned in You gotta watch This show is one of a kind Updates on your TV screen From 8 to 9 For the older folks So even if you younger No matter what sport This show we got it covered It's filmed live In the middle of BK So ain't no better sports show To watch on Thursdays Real fans, real talk We as real as you thought Real fans, real talk We the illest of course Real fans, real talk We the illest of course Real fans, real talk What's really good and welcome back to another collaboration episode of Real Fans Real Talk and the Sanchez Show. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Sanchez, aka Legend of Two Games. And as always, I got my homie with me, Anthony Jones, aka Trip Young. Trip, how you doing today, man? Oh man, I'm 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 good, man. I'm 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 in a good mood. My 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 pick didn't go through, but you know, Tom Brady is still my favorite player, so I'm still good either, either way. You know what I'm saying? I, I took an L on the pick, but my God still took the dub, so I'm good. Well, that's where we got to start. Super Bowl 55 went down yesterday. We're just uh, right about 24 hours since the completion of, of yesterday's game. So now we, we've had an opportunity to let some things digest. Obviously, Tom Brady winning his seventh Super Bowl, fifth Super Bowl MVP. The Buccaneers defense completely shutting down Patrick Mahomes and the reigning champions. What were your initial thoughts as the game was playing out and ultimately once we knew what the result was going to be? Um, the crazy thing was, as the game was playing out, I mean, up until I think like maybe like the five or six minute mark in the, um, excuse me, up until about the five or six minute mark in the third quarter, I was still thinking, you know what? The, the Chiefs are actually still in <laughs> position to come back in this game. Um, but then, you know, after that, it was just like, you know what? Yeah, enough, enough is enough. Um, I didn't think, to be honest with you, that losing those those two uh, tackles, that it would be that bad. Um, but, it, you know, but it was, you, you know, shifting your, your whole line pretty much. Like their whole offensive line, was out of sorts and it's not a situation where this is week 13 and you got a chance to build up some type of uh, chemistry with your, with your offensive line and those guys kind of playing together as a collective unit, literally, you know, the tackle went out in the was third quarter of the bills game and they shuffled their positions around. There's, there's no games in between the championship game and the super bowl. So there's really no way to actually get that in game chemistry and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defensive line, hats off to them. They completely dominated the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, what they say, Matt Mahomes ran for like 427 yards uh, before passing the football in that game, which was like a record. Um, they ran him pretty much all over the field. And because of the limitations with the, the Chiefs offensive line, they were able to rush four and put everybody else back into coverage, which was able to take away from what uh, Tyreek Hill is able to, to bring to the table. Because Kelsey still had a had a, a, a hundred plus yards uh, receiving. He was still doing his thing. But when you take away one of those, I call it the three points to the triangle, Mahomes, Hill, and Kelsey, you take away Tyreek Hill and what he's able to do 
you know, and they and that's what they did. And they had a hard time. And as you can see, no touchdowns from uh, Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, so I, to me, the point that I knew, like, all right, it's over was start of the fourth quarter. The Chiefs are in the red zone. They're down 22 points, so it's a three-possession game. So if they can score there, I thought, all right, there's opportunity because there was still about 14 minutes left in the game. Once they didn't score there, I knew, all right, they, they're not going to come back because now you still need your defense to get three stops for you to get the ball back. And you're talking, again, 13 minutes left in the game. Like, you know, we knew Tampa wasn't going to do anything silly and put the ball up in the air and start turning the ball over. They were going to try to kill as much clock as possible. So that was the point for me where I knew it was over. But I got to be honest, I'm not going to let the Chiefs off the hook by saying it was their offensive line's fault. And here's why. Yes, they lost Eric Fisher in the AFC Championship game. They had two weeks to prepare for this game. Those old linemen had all taken snaps at some point this season. So had they had to rearrange things in the middle of the game, yes, then I can understand it being complete chaos and guys not being on the same page. But you had two weeks to prepare. Coming into this game, there was no secret that you needed to keep Patrick Mahomes upright because this pass rush for the Bucs is, is one of the best in football. We knew that already. We knew you weren't going to be able to run the ball against them because Tampa Bay was the number one rush defense. So you had to be able to keep Patrick Mahomes on his feet to deliver the ball down the field. I put a lot of the blame, and I hate to do this because I, I think highly of this guy, of this coach, but I put the blame on Eric Bieniemy and Andy Reid. I don't feel they made any in-game adjustments to protect Patrick Mahomes. When did they leave a running back in to help block? When did they leave Travis Kelsey in to help block? Your O-line is getting dominated, and yet you're still sending five receivers out into the pattern and never max protecting and making sure that you can at least block a little bit for Patrick Mahomes. I thought they did him a disservice by just continuing to stay business as usual, and we're just going to keep letting everybody release out and try to find somebody. Once you figure out it's not working, you've got to make the in-game adjustments. And that's why I got to tip my hat to Bruce Arians, because all year I've been very critical of Bruce Arians, because I didn't feel he could make the necessary adjustments for Tampa Bay to be a Super Bowl team. But if you look at the beginning of the game, first possession, Tampa goes three and out. Second possession, Tampa goes three and out. But in doing so, they started to realize Frank Clark is getting some pressure. Kansas City's getting a little bit of pressure. So what do they do? Then they immediately come out the next possession. They ran three screen plays. They hit Cameron Bray. They hit Ronald Jones, and then they hit Gronk for the touchdown. So by doing that, they immediately slowed down the pass rush because now you had to pay attention to all these guys coming out the backfield, catching the ball quick. Next Gen Stat released a stat this morning. Brady average time from snap to releasing a ball was two and a half seconds. It was the fastest of any game he ever played in his career. 20 plus years in the league, and the Bucs knew Kansas City can get pressure. So we got to get the ball out quick. Of course, they would love to get the ball down the field to Mike Evans and Godwin. But you know what? That might not be there. So let's get it out quick. And in doing so, we saw Gronk have a great game. We saw Leonard Fournette have a big game running and catching the ball. Mm -hmm. Th those are the adjustments I'm talking about that you have to make in the Super Bowl. And I've got to put some blame on Biennemi and Andy Reid because coming in, as you said, we have a makeshift line. All right. So if this plan doesn't work, what is our plan B? Because we can't allow Patrick Mahomes to sit there and just get beat up the whole game. It's, it's not going to work. Tony Romo, even during the game, had mentioned it. He noticed it earlier. Not only were they double-teaming Tyreek Hill, they were double-teaming Travis Kelsey, which means you're getting one-on-one -on -one with somebody else. Sammy Watkins got to win a battle. McCole Hartman got to win a battle. Clyde edwards Hillier coming out the backfield got to win a battle. At, at some point, you've got to adjust and get the ball to somebody else. No, that's a fact. Um, and I, and I want to add in, because now I have my triangle on the offensive uh, side for the Chiefs, but I also had a triangle for the blame game in, in this uh, Super Bowl and why the uh, the Chiefs lost. So one was the offensive line because they were just horrible. We we just gonna call it what it was. They would they they couldn't stop anything from going down. Two, you are absolutely right. The coaching staff because they there was no adjustments made in that game. And I, listen, much respect to Patrick Mahomes because that young man tried literally everything possible to move the football to get completions you know I, the, the one play when he's like about to fall out of bounds on the side and still gets the pass off they don't get the completion but it just shows you he's literally at the end of his wits like all right what do i gotta do at this point so that's two that's the coaching staff is two but three i gotta put some of that onus on the players 
95 penalty yards in the first half, you're not going to win a football game like that because pretty much every one of those penalties put the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a better position to score. And there will be times where they would get the stops. It will be, you know, third and long, something would happen. They would they, 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 they get down the field, stop them. They stopped them on the goal line just to, 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 to get the ball back, just to have, have themselves jammed back up by another penalty. The only penalty, there was two penalties where I was like, all right, you know, now it's just like, come on, enough is enough, was the play at the end of, of the half, which is a play that, that they, they do all the time. Tom Brady's been doing that play for years because he's trying to get the pass interference call, the, the long ball. And if you notice, that probably was the, the, the longest pass that Tom Brady threw in that entire game. Absolutely. Everything else, he was dinking and dunking. Absolutely. He was not throwing down the field. You got to know, and that, and that goes back to the coaches. You got to know because we saw this and the Saints game, Scotty Miller. And with that much, with that little bit of time left on the clock, if Tom Brady has the ball, he's going to air it out because he's going to either try to get a touchdown over the top or he's going to try to get the pass interference cold. So you got a game plan for that as well. You can't pick up that penalty, even though I was a little iffy on that one. And then the Tyran Matthew penalty, which I thought was BS um, because that's – if. Either the penalty should have been canceled out because I thought Tom Brady should have got a penalty as well. But you can't, you know what I'm saying? But to just give it to Tyran Ty Matthew in that situation, I, th I thought that was corny, especially when you see, um, you know, after the game, Brady texts Tyran Matthew to apologize to him. So you know something went down that, you know what I'm saying, where it was like, all right, now we, we back to, to giving Tom Brady the golden boy status. So just, just those two was the only ones I really had a problem with. I, I, I knew in the second half the penalties was going to go down um, for, the, for the Chiefs. I think it was they, they finished the game with 120 uh, penalty yards. So, they, you know, the second half they kind of, you know, took care of the, the, the issues they were having as far as the penalties go. But it was, it was just, it was just little too, too little too late. You know, when they got that last touchdown at the half, I was like, it's going to be real. It's going to be tough. I still thought they could come back because, you know, we've, we've, we've been used to that. We're used to the Chiefs coming back. So I still thought they had a chance to come back. But I'm like, all right, you, you're going to make it gonna make it hard on yourself. Right. Sure enough. Right. And, and my issue with the officials in the first half, and that's not to say that some of those things weren't penalties. Like the, the Mike Evans play, tricky, but it is a penalty, you know. Unfortunately, the defender and Mike Evans, he trips over Mike Evans' feet, and on his way as he's falling, he ends up pulling down Mike Evans. It's a penalty. Fine. Yeah. What I didn't like about it, though, was that it was only being called physical one way, and that's what I have a problem with because we saw the same thing in the Tampa Bay-Green Bay game where Tampa Bay secondary was allowed to be as physical as they wanted at the line of scrimmage, whether it was grabbing, holding, whatever the case may be, but they weren't allowing it on the other end. When Green Bay would do it, they would, they would be a call. And a prime example of that was on the, the deflection that led to Tyron Matthews' interception yesterday, which was later reversed. On that one, they called a penalty, and both receivers are jostling on the outside. Yeah. Both, both guys are going at it on the outside, and you call the penalty. And, and you hear Tyron Matthews saying that ball is tipped, which means the moment that ball is tipped, it is no longer – nothing can be called in terms of illegal contact or pass interference now. So you, you don't allow that. But when we see when we're seeing the clips of how physical that Tampa Bay's being with Kelsey and Hill, they're grabbing and holding the whole weight, right? And on on the first Mahomes interception, when the defender comes over Tariq Hill's back and, and tips the ball in the air, which leads to the inception, he's holding Tariq Hill's jersey the whole time as yep. the ball is approaching and tips it. So I'm not gonna say the refs altered the game. I felt they they were a little too involved early in the game. If you're going to say, hey, look, we're going to allow you to be physical with the receivers, fine, but allow it on both sides. You can't then say we're going to call it strong one way, but not the other. You got to maintain a, a certain balance. But I will say, despite all that, it's 21 6 at the half. I thought Kansas City still had a great opportunity to get into the game because they were getting the ball to start the second half. And on their first drive, they were doing some good things. They were getting rid of the ball quick. Travis Kelsey was getting going in the middle of the field. They, they ran up a little bit. Right, they ran the ball a little bit. They stalled out. They get a field goal. So now they get it to 21-9. Then after that, 
again, they never go back to that concept on offense. Now it was almost waiting all the time to get the deep ball, get the deep ball, get the deep ball. You didn't have to. Travis Kelsey went for a buck 20 over the middle of the field. It was there. But again, they, their impatience to want to force the ball down the field, I think hurt them. Coaching needed to be better. And I'm not going to say this is one of the reasons they lost, but the moment I saw this news broke, well, when the news broke that Andy Reid's son was involved in a car accident that left the young child in critical condition, yeah. I knew this wasn't going to end well for Kansas City because anybody who has watched enough Super Bowls knows you don't need any distractions 48 hours prior to the game. We saw it in, in, the, in the 90s. Eugene Robinson for the Packers got arrested two days before they played the Broncos. They were the defending champs. They, were, they looked like a shell of themselves in that game because they couldn't stay focused. Yep. Icky Woods, it happened when he was with the Bengals. He relapsed, unfortunately. It ruined their opportunity to win the Super Bowl. When you are so focused on having to go in to beat another great team, the last thing you need to be worried about is stuff that's taking place that has nothing to do with on the field. That's Andy Reid's son. He's a coach. He was supposed to be on a plane with them that Saturday. There's nobody that can tell me they weren't at least thinking about it a little bit, knowing that one of their coaches wasn't there. Of course. And, 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 and you know, he, he wound up not being able – to coach in that game as well. So, you know, that, that, those are little things where it's like, those can be the difference in these type of situations. Uh, you know, and it, 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 the fact that this is Andy Reid's son, I mean, any, any coach that would have done, you know, would have been just like, yo, what's wrong with you? But it's Andy Reid's son. So that's even more added on to the situation. And it's just like, like, why, what are, what are you doing? So it was kind of like, so we, we go from, we got the injury to the to the tackle and in, uh in the in the Bills game in the second half. Then we get we get through the we get through a week and then we have the situation with Andy Reid's son. It's just like are we just going downhill and then come come Super Bowl time, you guys and they 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 lay the egg. I, and I was just at, at in the fourth quarter. I'm just like, damn, can we we gotta at least get a touchdown out of this thing? Like, don't don't go out like this, fellas. Like as much you know, what I'm saying like and again because you you know I'm a Tom Brady fan. So it doesn't bother me that that the Bucks won, but you know I still I, I you know I'm always gonna support the black quarterbacks, so I, I wanted them to at least get a touchdown, like make it look make it look respectable, you know what I mean? So please just just make it look respectable. Um, I would love to see a rematch next year in the Super Bowl when the Chiefs have an, a, a healthy offensive line. I know the teams are probably gonna be a little bit different. Uh, just because a couple of guys are under contracts are up, they're gonna have to resign, especially on the on the Bucks uh, side of the of the ball. They got a couple of key positions. Uh, White, uh, the middle linebacker, his contract is up. Uh, was Shaq Barrett, his contract is up. Fournette's gonna have to be renewed. Gronk is gonna have to be renewed. Shout out to Gronk too. Uh, <laughs> what are you gonna say about the, the Gronkinator? Yeah, Gronk. Gronk looked like his old self, and and as I've, I've as I've said before. And these moments, Brady's gonna trust the guys that he's most comfortable with. And as you see, all the guys who the guys who scored yesterday, Gronk twice, Antonio Brown once, those are guys that have close relationships with Tom that he knows I can rely on you in these big moments. Do you um think, yeah, question, because I, I when I was uh as as I'm checking the stats uh on the game and I'm looking, I'm like, damn, he only went to Mike Evans once. He went to Godwin like four times, he got one completion to Godwin. Do you think that that those two felt any type of way during the game that they weren't getting, you know, passes thrown in their direction? Um, probably not. I don't. I don't think they probably felt any type of way because in that moment, I'm sure, like the same way as we're fans watching it, and the game is going by fast. Like you don't realize how quick the game goes by yeah. until you look at the clock and it's like, oh, it's late in the third quarter already. You know what I'm saying? So he targeted Mike Evans a couple of times. It just obviously. He, they drew penalties off it. You know, there was a pass yeah, interference yeah, yeah. on one sideline. There was a pass interference in the end zone. He caught him on a, on a deep uh, crossing route. So he did throw to him. It was just they only had the one completion. Same thing with Godwin. He tried to get him the ball early on their first third down, and it was an incompletion. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, I, he probably, in his mind, knew, let me get those guys involved a little bit. But push come to shove. The old faithful. <laughs> yeah. Gronk, where you at, Gronk? Let me, let me get the ball to 87. Let me get the ball to 81. Because those are the guys that I that already know where where they need to be. We should have known something was up when they when they went back and they did the bad boys uh, for like. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> and yeah, and and I will say this, and I agree with you. Um, in terms of Tampa Bay's got a couple things they need to clear up. Shaq Barrett's going to be a, a major priority for them. They may lose Indomitian Sue, um, so that they can That's keep right. Shaq. 
Yeah. Um, I think Devin White is only in his third year, so they, they might just be working on a, on an extension. So they may not lose him, but on the offense, you know, what are they going to do with Antonio? Because he was on a one-year deal. Uh, I well, think they're, Brock, not gonna, they're not going to be able to afford, afford Antonio. Right. I think Leonard, yeah, Fournette, I Leonard Fournette ran his way into a big contract, I think. So they, they'll lose him as well. But ultimately, that, that defense is still very young. That secondary is very young. They'll be in the mix. Kansas City will be interesting to see what they do. But I, I am of the belief that it's very tough to keep going back to Super Bowls. And, yes. yeah, they went to back-to-back. But the year before they went to a Super Bowl, they also went to an AFC Championship game. So now we're talking three deep playoff runs. Mm -hmm. To do it a fourth time is going to be very tough. And we can't forget, Mahomes was a little hurt last year. And he got healthy just at the right time for the playoffs. This year, he's been dealing with the toe. He's been a little hurt. Those are the little ticky tack injuries that start to add up that sometimes could slow you down. I think they still have a bright future. I think they're still going to be one of the best teams in the league for years to come. But to get to a third Super Bowl is going to be very tough now after the type of loss they just had. They they may be able to have if they can keep that core group together, you know, a a a Patriot esque kind of run where they they win a division. Um, every year, not saying they're going to win, obviously, because Patriots didn't win Super Bowls every year, but as far as just winning the division, because I haven't seen just yet uh, a, a team where I'm like, oh, they on their heels. You know what I mean? Like, I know they, they lost to the to the Raiders, uh, you know, during the, during the regular season, but the Raiders ain't in that caliber. You know what no. I mean? And you're going to lose some. I just, I think there's, there's, there's a gap similar to the gap that was in, in the AFC East where it was like the Patriots and then, you know, the Dolphins and the, and the Jets and maybe sometimes in the, you know, in the Bills. Now that, I mean, now the Bills, you know, have finally caught up and took over, but I think that we could see that with the Chiefs. Um, I do think they will be back to a Super Bowl because I just think that Patrick Mahomes is, is, is great. You know, they still got Tyreek Hill and, and Travis Kelsey locked in and that's a hell of a one, two, three punch. Well, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, no, they have all the weapons. I, I'm not disputing that at all. I my concern is just the wear and tear on the body. Yeah. Because when you consistently play that deep into the season, you know, you, you're now you're coming into the next season. You didn't get a full off season. You know, again, we're in February. The drafts in April. Teams start reporting in May. Yeah. So you got three months really to heal up before you got to start reporting again. And this is a very similar situation to what we saw with the Seahawks and the Legion of Boom. You know, they they had a really good run. They went to back-to-back -to -back Super Bowls. They had some deep playoff runs. Yeah. But slowly but surely, the injuries start to catch up with you because it's such a physical game. The Chiefs are the best team in the AFC. But we can't pretend that the landscape of the AFC won't shift if, let's say, Deshaun Watson ends up on the right team in the AFC, right? So if Deshaun ends up on the Dolphins team that has a really good defense, now we're talking about a different scenario. You know, if if Deshaun ends up on the Raiders because John Gruden is fond of him, it's a different scenario. If I don't think he would, but if he would end up on the Colts with that defense, it's a different scenario now. So Deshaun possibly being traded could shift the whole landscape of the AFC as well. That's a fact. That's why I'm, I'm like, I, I, I feel like if the Texans do trade him, they would want to trade him at least out of the AFC so they don't have to, to deal with him anymore. But yeah. Who knows? Uh, now, right now, you know, now that you brought Watson up, the uh, Texans said that they're not trading him, uh, but he has requested a trade. So I think it's just a foregone conclusion before he winds up out of there because I do feel like he's, he is willing to hold out. It, 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 and he's absolutely right in doing so because the, the level of incompetence within the Texans organization the past three seasons is just like, if I'm if I'm young, and I'm a I'm a I'm 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 in that uh, elite upper echelon of quarterbacks, why am I trying to stick around with an organization that is not trying to get better? When you give away arguably the best wide receiver in football at the time, you know what I mean? You're, you're giving away all of these these great pieces, and you know you gave away all your draft picks, so you can't draft any anybody really. So why would I want to stay with the the, the the Texans? So I think it's a foregone conclusion that he will be out of there. I know they're saying no, but you know that could also be to put some more on that. Put some more on that. On oh, that. Oh no, he's oh, he's you know? yeah he's 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 out of there. He's out of there. And I think right now they're just weighing the options. 
um, they're saying, yeah, we, we don't plan on trading him because they're hoping that he changes his mind. You know, you yeah, don't, that's really what it is. You know, we know how tough it is to find a franchise quarterback, a true franchise quarterback. And so at 26 years old, this would be unprecedented for him to be traded. I, I can't think of any time in NFL history that a quarterback that good at that age was traded. So they're going to try everything in their power to keep him. But it would be foolish of the front office if come April, when the draft rolls around, that you don't at least take a long, hard look at some of the packages you're getting. Yeah. You know, if, if the Dolphins are willing to toss you the number three pick and some other stuff, you would be a fool to say no when you know Deshaun doesn't want to be there because then you run the risk of him holding out and then showing up late or reporting late for the season and then your whole season sabotaged again. Oh, by the way, you don't have next year's first round pick anyway. So you you passed up on, on getting a first round pick this year and then you could be tanking next year again without the possibility of a first round pick. So they're saying all the right things, but he's going to get moved. And I think it's just going to be a matter of who's willing to give up the best package for him. Absolutely. Really quick, I want I want to go back um, to uh, Andy Reid's son. Uh, Three hundred thousand dollars was uh, raised, and it will be going towards the uh, I guess you know for for the victims of the uh, of the car crash. So you know I don't know who stepped up and put and, and put money in the pot, but three hundred dollars obviously you know rather have everybody in good health and in, in good state of mind. You know what I mean, but you know it's good to see people pitching in during these uh, during these times. Absolutely. Um, question for you, Eric: Was Tom Brady the MVP last night? So no, I didn't think he was the MVP. I wasn't mad that he got it. Um, I think they had multiple guys on their defense that had multiple sacks. Uh, obviously, Shaq Barrett and Dama Kasu. Uh, Devin White played a great game and finished with an interception. But for me. The MVP yesterday was Leonard Fournette. I thought the way he ran the ball, the way he was able to give him balance because he was catching the ball out the backfield. Um, I, I didn't look at, I haven't looked at the numbers yet, I, but I remember looking at him pretty quickly after the game yesterday, and I think he finished with over seventy yards rushing and another forty receiving. Yeah, yeah, he, so, he had over hundred uh, total, yeah, total yards. To me, to me, I I thought his impact on the game was that great. That's why I would have given him the MVP, but I'm not mad at Tom getting it. Yeah, I mean, they're going to give it to Tom. <laughs> it's Tom. Uh, however, I, I didn't think that Tom was the MVP. Maybe, I mean, I mean, I know he got the three touchdowns. Maybe I would have liked to see if, if he had 350 yards passing to go with those three touchdowns and they gave him the MVP, I'd be like, all right. But again, everything you, you mentioned uh, about Leonard Fournette, and then that the the front four, like if you could if you could give the MVP to the 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 Bucks front four, because in reality, you know what I'm saying it was great, you know that you know Tom Brady put touchdowns on the board, but I, I I thought it was because it was more impressive how they shut down the the Chiefs offense, which has been a top five offense for the past three years. I thought it was more amazing because. No one expected the Chiefs defense to shut down the Buccaneers. They're not, we're not talking about the Rams defense. We're not talking about the Ravens defense. You know what I mean? So no one expected that. I, I we we kind of even both thought it would have been a shootout anyway. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I thought it was just it was it, you know so impressive what they were able to do to hold that offense to three field goals. You got to give the defense some love. And I know it's football offense is always going to get the accolades, you know what I mean? But in this situation, I thought you should have considered the, the, the defense because they did a hell of a job shutting down that offense. Absolutely. I mean, the the one of the main reasons that I really wasn't looking at the Bucs as the favorite to win a Super Bowl or come out of the NFC was that they were so inconsistent all year, right? They would have moments, but then they would have other times where you look at them like they, they're not really ready for it. I don't think they are, you know, so their defense gave up 20 plus points to the backup quarterback in Washington, gave up 20 plus points to a Saints team that couldn't throw the ball down the field, gave up 20 plus points last week to Green Bay, even though Aaron Jones missed the whole second half. So there's no way somebody could have told me not only are they going to shut down the Chiefs, they're not even going to give up a touchdown. I'd have like, you're lying because I just seen three other teams that don't have the offensive firepower that Kansas City has been able to put up points. But 
you're right. They came in super motivated. Uh, they took on the challenge. They came in with a, with a great game plan. And we got to salute Ty Bowles for what he did because Ty Bowles went in there. And if, if it had not worked, we would have criticized them. But he, he said, look, I'm sitting both my safeties up top. I'm not letting you throw anything down the field. And you're going to have to dink and dunk. And if you're willing to take the 7 to 10 yard pass all day and beat me that way, so be it. And Kansas City wasn't patient enough to do it. And, and therefore, like you said, that front four was able to feast and dominate on a team that just wasn't willing to make adjustments. Now, question, you know, Eric, and I got to because you, you brought up uh, Todd Bowles. I just want to make sure that you were actually talking about Todd Bowles when you made that statement, because, you know, you got some journalists out there that don't know the difference between Byron Leftwich and Ty Bowles. They think, Bowles, they think all brothers look alike for some reason. Right, right. So, I mean, first of all, you should turn in your damn media badge if you don't know who you're asking the question to, all right? <laughs> uh, Todd Bowles and Byron Leftwich look nothing alike. So, well, were at all. <laughs> nothing alike. So it's not like a, it's not like one of them cases where it's like, oh, Yo, you kind of look like nah, they don't look nothing alike. Ty Bowles definitely deserves his credit. Um, he, you know, he left New York under bad terms with the Jets, but I'm happy for him and I'm happy for that whole staff, man, because we talked about it before. Bruce Arians has a very diverse coaching staff, you know, with minorities, with right. women, and kudos to them for all getting their first ring together. That's a fact. That's a fact. Congratulations again, man. Um, you know, the, the, listen, the, the brothers did their thing coaching, coaching on both sides of the football today. Um, you, which is, the crazy thing is, is that Byron Leftwich played quarterback in this league for for a pretty lengthy yeah. amount of time. I, so I you think he had a solid Byron Leftwich. Is. Yeah, he had a, a solid eight to ten year career. Yeah. So, so like, I, I, did you just start watching football this week? Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But um uh Sam Donald, Jets, uh they're getting some offers. Um I I think you know, let him go. <laughs> I agree. Whatever you can get. Um, I don't know if he's worth a, a first round pick, maybe a late first round pick, but if you can finesse a first round pick, get it. If you can get a second and a fourth or something like that, whatever you can get, get it. Um, because if you're I mean, you got the number two pick in the draft. Obviously, you know what I'm saying, new system up in there, new new regime. You know, I, I think the, the smart pick is the quarterback, Justin Fields, or, if you, you know, I know I hear some people talking about Zach Collins. I, I'd go with Justin Fields. Um, but if you can get rid of Sam Darnold and get an extra either late first rounder or, or a second rounder, I mean, we're talking about football. This ain't, this ain't like an NBA second round draft pick, you know what I'm saying, where it's like I probably ain't going to get nobody crazy. Um, but if you can do it, by all means. And it might be the best thing for Sam Darnold too. So let, you know, let him go someplace else and, and, and restart because he's actually shown in spots that he can be good, but we can't really get a good idea of what exactly his his peak is playing for the Jets. You know what I mean? And I don't I don't I don't see them building up a a, a team this year to really say, all right, now we can go out there and try this thing out. So that might be the best thing for him. Without a doubt, uh, he deserves a fresh start too. I mean, he's going into year four and this is already his third different head coach. You know, the, the kid deserves a fresh start. They have not done a good job of surrounding him with talent. Um, I was talking about this yesterday with Will from On The Board Sports. You know, they they haven't utilized any of their draft capital to get him any skill set players. You know, they drafted a running back late in last year's draft. They didn't draft a receiver. They just started addressing the O-line. They need a tight end. They need a lot of help on that offense. And it's just unfair to the young man to be in that situation again with another coach, with a new offensive system, now having to learn that offensive system, get him out of there and, and completely retool. You know, you like you said, use your pick to draft your new quarterback who will be under a rookie deal, which will allow you to spend the rest of that money on other areas or flip that pick for Deshaun Watson. But start fresh at the quarterback position because – he deserves better at this point. Cause that's the thing. If you if you actually either way you're good because if you if you trade Darnold and you're able to get a late first rounder or 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 early second rounder for him, then you can draft Justin Fields and with that later pick you can draft your wide receiver because there's going to be a couple of wide receivers in the first round that will still be on the board even in the second round you can because I mean we saw Jefferson win the second round last year and he was <laughs> almost rookie of the year. 
Jeff Jefferson went uh, late first, but we did see Chase Claypool in the second round. We saw Michael Pittman Jr. There was a, a, a lot of talent in the second round of the, of the draft last year. Exactly. And either way, if you trade, if you make that trade and you get the song with Sean Watson, then all right. And you got an extra extra pick, draft your receiver. So either way, they, it still works. Yeah, they, they've got they've got two picks in the first round this year and next year because of the Jamal Adams trade. So, exactly. you know, they they've got their pick at number three, and then they got that Seahawks pick, which is probably right in the range of somewhere of like 19 to 23, 24. So they could load up on some young talent there. I, I, for me, though, I, I say move on from Darno. Like you said, pick up as many assets as you can. If you could pick up a second or and a four, or you know, uh, if you can get a late first, take it. But whatever you can, let the kid move on and you move on. Your, your new head coach and GM deserve a fresh start as well. They shouldn't have to be carrying a guy who they didn't select, and now they're trying to figure out how to make it work. Exactly. And if you can even get a, a late first rounder, you could actually package that that first rounder with that Seahawks pick and go up even further and, and get one of the top three wide receivers. Right. You know what I mean? So they, they, they definitely have a, a lot of options. Um, you know, will the Jets screw it up? <laughs> Who knows? I can't Probably. say, um, but some, some guys that definitely got it right. The uh, hall of fame voting class. Uh, we saw, we saw last week, no one made it into the, to the MLB hall of fame <laughs> this year, but the NFL, is headlined by a couple of uh, of my favorite players, a couple of the, the the greatest to play their respective positions, uh, Megatron, Calvin Johnson Jr., Peyton Manning, Charles Woodson will be the headliners of the 2021 NFL Hall of Fame class, and all three of those guys are more than deserving of putting on that jacket. Oh, absolutely, Peyton Manning, one of my favorites of all time, man. Legends recognize legends in. Um, you know, I, I always, even though Tom is the GOAT at the quarterback position, I think very few were able to understand and dissect the position the way Peyton Manning did. I mean, when you talk about somebody who was the definition of unathletic, it was Peyton Manning. He could not move to save his life. But he was a cerebral assassin. But he could dice you up from the pocket and get the ball wherever it needed to go. It wasn't the strongest arm. It wasn't always the prettiest throw, but it was where it needed to be. Okay. Um, so respect to him. Charles Woodson, I mean... What, what else is left to be said about Charles? I mean, Charles has a majority of the records for, for secondary players to ever, you know, to ever played the game. Heisman Trophy winner. Now he's a Hall of Famer, Super Bowl champion, national champion in college, played both sides of the ball. He had a Hall of Fame career as a cornerback even before he went to safety. And then he went to safety and damn near had a Hall of Fame career as a safety when you look at his numbers from that position. So definitely a, a, a true legend and one of the greatest players of all time. And Megatron... Man, unfortunately, he played in a city that just never, or a team, I should say, that never put enough talent around him. But when he was on the field, man, he was without a doubt the best receiver in the game during those years. And it was, just, it was just unfortunate that, you know, him and Stafford, that's all they had. They didn't have a defense. They didn't have a running game. Yeah. It was just them two guys, and it was just chuck it up and, and go get it. That's a fact. And uh, Charles Woodson, just to go back for a second, is the only player to have 50 50- plus interceptions and 20 plus um, sacks in a career. So, I mean, th- you know, those guys, the, the caliber, I think uh, also Alan uh, Fanica, the, the offensive lineman for the Steelers is going to be in this uh, Hall of Fame class as well. So yeah. once again, just congratulations to everybody that uh, that made it in this year. I'm, I'm still shaking my head at the fact that no one is in the MLB Hall of Fame this year. But, yeah, uh, you know, we got to wait and see. And I, I want to say this too, man, I hope he gets in next year. Reggie Wayne, man. Reggie Wayne mm. is top 15 in damn near every receiving category. He deserves to go in. Uh, he was, you know, for lack of a better term, he was the poor man's version of Chris Carter because he wasn't a burner, but he yeah. had great hands. And again, a guy that won a Super Bowl, uh, multiple time pro bowler. He deserves to get in. I hope I hope he gets in next year. That's a fact. Um, shout out, shout out to, to Reggie Wayne, Wayne as well. Um, our new president, Mr. Biden. Um, he is going to be teaming up with the NFL and the NBA, um, but they will be using the uh, NFL stadiums as vaccines uh, sites. You guys know we are still dealing with this pandemic and all the damage that the coronavirus has done. Um, you know, so our our the head of our nation is is, is trying to work this thing out. And a big shout out to, to, to him, his staff, as well as the NFL um, 
for donating their, their stadiums. Again, as they also did this, you know, during election uh, time where they donated stadiums, the, the NBA and the NFL donated uh, stadiums to help out with voting. And now they're donating their stadiums to help out um, to get the vaccine out to, to, to everybody in this country. Absolutely. And it's refreshing that we have a leader who's taking this serious and uh, advising people to do the right thing. And him and his wife actually have put out a message before kickoff yesterday, just advising everyone, do the right thing. Make sure you're wearing your mask, make sure you're social distancing. And he's not treating this as fake news or, or some sort, so, some type of facade. He's, he's handling it the way it should be handled. Exactly. So big shout out to, to Mr. President. Um, I know he's, he's excited because he's going to have a couple of teams that are ready to come back to the White House and go chop it up with him, get some picks in. You know what I'm saying? We kind, I kind of miss that because I do like when the players get to go to the White House, but we didn't, you know, we didn't see that for a little while. So I did. You yeah, know. yeah. But, well, LeBron and him, I believe, are the first ones that are going back, right? Yeah. Lakers are going to be the first ones going back. Yeah. LeBron said he was excited. I'm excited about it. You know, so that's that's going to be dope. He gets to to, to go and chill with the, with the first ever uh, uh, African-American and woman vice president as well. And, and it's Kamala Harris. You know, so you got you to gotta love him, man. Things, things are looking up, man. Things are definitely looking up. Uh, things are looking up for your Knicks. They, had, they, they made a big trade. They brought, they brought back Derrick Rose. Um, who's actually had a, had a really good uh, the past couple of years. You know, the career injuries kind of took a toll and, and cost him a couple of years in between there. But he's actually been looking really good the past couple of years. And uh, the Knicks didn't have to give up much to get him. Um, I like the move for the Knicks. Cause I, you know, I think Derrick Rose would definitely be an upgrade um, at, at, at the guard position for them from any of the other point guards they had. And again, all they had to give up was De uh, Dennis Smith Jr. and a second round draft pick. Uh, Eric, but you, but you let me know how you how you feel about it. I love the move. Um, you know, the, his first stint with us didn't go well. And looking back on it, I understood why he, he was dealing with some, some uh, things in his personal life at the time. And um, now to see that it's come full circle, he released a nice message today as well, talking about, you know, being thankful to get a second chance to come to the Knicks and making right on what happened the first time. And obviously him and Tibbs have a great relationship. So he's super excited to be playing for his old coach. And you're right on. He is going to be an upgrade at the point guard position. No disrespect to Alfred Payton, but Alfred Payton ain't Derrick Rose. No, and uh, you know what I'm saying? So either it's off the rivers or right. Junior or anybody. <laughs> right. right. So I, I, I love the move from that standpoint. Um, you know, I know I've been joking about it. You know, if the season ended today, we'd be in the playoffs. And yeah, that's true. But in, in all in all seriousness, if we want to take that legit step to being a playoff team, this is one of those moves you got to make where you bring in a proven veteran who can help you and help get, develop the young guys. Because I like Emmanuel quickly, but quickly is not ready to be a starting point guard. You know, RJ showing some growth, but RJ ain't a point guard. You need a guy who can get him the ball. Exactly. So I think Derrick Rose is going to be great. He was averaging about 14 and four with Detroit. You put him with Julius Randle. I think we, we've got a, a, a solid chance to, to really solidify a playoff spot. That's a fact. Shout out to the Knicks, man. Oh, uh, they 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 making making moves. Um, Nets is making moves too. They they brought in uh Noah Vonley today as well. They they needed a replacement for KD because he's now out with his uh, second uh COVID protocol. <laughs> so I you know I it was the craziest situation uh the other night because he was pulled, you know mid game. He was told first he wasn't gonna play. Then he was. They let him play. Then he was pulled mid game, but the the thing that that bothered me is okay. If you took Kevin Durant out of the game that he was already playing in because of uh, of COVID, he was apparently he was riding around unmasked with a friend who tested positive for COVID. So if you if if it was serious enough to pull Kevin Durant out of a game that he was already playing in, that he had already been around his teammates in both the locker room and on the court, as well as the other um, team who had been in the game at that point as as well, guarding Kevin Durant, which probably was worse than actually his teammates because they're actually standing in front of him. I just didn't understand why didn't you just cancel a game for all of that? The league still doesn't know how to handle this and it's expected. We, we don't know as a country really how to handle it, but the NBA is still trying to figure it out. We talked about it on a previous episode, you know, for everything that happened in the bubble, this is the opposite. Now there's no bubble and it's very tough to keep guys contained and, and distance from each other. 
guys are flying into different cities. And like you said, sometimes they get around friends and, hey, let's go out to dinner. Let's go grab a bite. So it, it's it's super tough for the league to, to really police. And this is why I don't understand this whole talk of wanting to have an all-star game. Yes. You know, you all, all the lead up to this season was we want you guys staying out of the, you know, staying out of the club, staying out of the restaurants, go to the games, go back to your room. They don't even want guys hugging after the game. They don't even want guys shaking hands after the game. But yeah. now you're going to put together an all-star weekend where you know guys are not going to be confined to their hotel room. It just makes no sense to me. Exactly. Shout out to LeBron because um, he kind of set the tone that I'm not feeling it, spoke his piece on it, and that kind of sparked, uh, you know, the other top guys around the league. Giannis came and he said, listen, I'm with the big dog. Big dog's he ain't with it, I ain't with it. Kawhi came out and spoke. You know, so uh, the superstars are speaking they don't really want to have the all-star game. Um, you know, especially I can understand for any anybody that made a playoff run, especially a deep playoff run. If you if you played in the second round of the playoffs, I could imagine you really did not want to play in this all-star festivities anyway, because you would, you know, you need that 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 rest, you need a little bit more time. Um, but when you add on the fact that guys are going in and out because of the COVID protocols every week. The Celtics damn near lost half their roster one week. KD's been out a couple of times. So you got you got teams around the league that are losing players to COVID. So why are we pushing to have an exhibition game? Just figure out who's going to be on the all-star team. Whoever made it, give them whatever bonuses they get because they made the all-star team. Let it go into the, to the history books. And that's it. Because it's not like a situation where, you know, how MLB – has it where if you you know you win the All Star game you get home field advantage? It's not like that. So if it, since it ain't like that, man, it's just scrap it. It's okay. It's, it's it's one year. I get it. You you know you're trying to make up for as as much money as you can because NBA did take a huge loss last season. They're taking a loss this season as well. But let's not push it, man. Let let's be let's be safe so that guys can make it through the season. I one thousand percent agree, and I hope Adam Silver recognizes that as well recognize the, the guys acknowledge them acknowledge them but move on no need for the game no need for the festivities and want to have a slam dunk contest and a three-point shootout for what exactly for like, what? why are we doing that right and 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 the whole thought of well they're trying to recoup some revenue yeah that makes sense but they're going to recoup some revenue anyway once they get into the playing tournament because those are additional games that no one was expecting anyway exactly so you can figure out a way to get the revenue other other places as opposed to putting the, the players in danger. I got an idea. I'm going to let them borrow this from us. They want to have an all-star game. They can have an all-star 2K tournament <laughs> during that week. Let the players stay home. The all-stars can have a tournament right there. We'll, they can call, call us up. We can give them the breakdown of how the tournament is supposed to go. Bing, bang, boom. Everybody wins. I like that idea. Cause you know, people love watching the players play when they have the, the little tournaments. Like remember they had the, uh, what was it Patrick Beverly was in the tournament last year. Mm -hmm. so th that was a big thing. Like we all, we was into that. Like I love seeing the players, you know, going at it. So, it, you know, it, it, Adam Silver usually gets it right. We commend him a, a lot. So I hope that there's some kind of reconsideration between the NBA and the players association and they can kind of take care of this thing. I agree. Cause you know, again, we, we still we still in, the, in in this pandemic. Um, you know, we gotta shout out one of the young brothers though, Zion. Um, cracked a thousand points on on the career, the youngest uh, cat to do it since my main man Big Shaq <laughs> did it. Um, and and the, the field goal percentage is amazing. He been going off <laughs> right now. He's he's been Zion going. has been going. He's he's find he's finding his comfort zone. He's been going off and he's staying healthy. Which is the other thing that you know? I mean, obviously, it's, it's only his second year, but he's been healthy this season for the most part. And he's he's his he was yeah, it's like sixty over sixty percent from the field. So I think he's doing his thing. You know, what I'm saying shout out to Zion. Um, you know, I hope he can stay healthy. I hope he can, can continue to keep this up because I do. You know, I, I want to see him him his career grow. Yeah, they got they got to figure out what they're doing with that roster. The roster is a little awkward. Um, you know, with him and Steven Adams both on the floor together, and then they trying to figure out if they're going to move Lonzo and move Redick. They got some things they got to figure out, but he's definitely been showing out the last month and a half, two months. He's really been going off. That's a fact. Um, a little bit of baseball news. 
uh, the, 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 the world champs, the Dodgers, I think they pushing for that repeat bid because they brought over Trevor Bauer, which I thought was an amazing signing. I'm still a little bit tight. I mean, I thought the Yankees should have went after him, um, but I know Cashman, he's trying to keep it on things under the luxury tax. I also read today that your Mets thought they had it in the bag as well. And he kind of like <laughs> got swooped away <laughs> and went out West. Yeah. On, on his website, they actually had posted it as if he was signing with the Mets. Mm. And then shortly after that, the news broke and he came out and even apologized today and was saying that that was a mistake on his, on his part. I guess the person who handles the website had got the news about the Mets offer and thought he was taking that offer. Yeah. And he apologized to, to the Mets fans, but we would have loved to, man, to have him in a rotation with the Grom, um, with Syndergaard coming back with, with Stroman and then Carrasco, who we just got in the Lindor trade. I mean, we would have loved to, to have those guys together. Y'all might have the best rotation right now. But then if you had Trevor Bauer to that, jeez, man. We, we would have loved to add him in there. I'm, I'm sure you would. <laughs> that would have been crazy. But he's going out west, and he's going to try to help those guys repeat out west. They got a hell of a team. Their rotation is crazy right now, too. Yeah, I mean, Kershaw ain't even what he used to be, and it's still a great rotation. Ex exactly. <laughs> so I, I'm looking forward to baseball, man. I'm waiting, I'm waiting on baseball to come back. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping the Yankees still manage to, to make a, another move or two. Um, to get ready for this season. Um, but I'm definitely looking forward to baseball. Shout out to the Yankees as well. They they're another one of those stadiums, um, teams that will be opening up their stadium, uh, to help with the COVID vaccine. You and I, you know, we're both in the Bronx. Well, you're in DC now, but you know, we're we're both a couple of minutes from Yankee Stadium where we were, where you were living, and where I live now. We're literally only a couple of minutes away. So shout out to the Yankees for for doing their part and um, offering Yankee Stadium up for the for the vaccine as well and a little bit of sad news i hate that we got to end off the show on a sad note but we we lost a member of the boxing community uh leon spinks and this is it was definitely a little bit even more bittersweet for us because he was at the last uh rank 10 new york charity dinner and um we didn't get the chance to chop it up with him because we had to we had to leave early um and he actually was going to chop it up mm -hmm. with us and it just that made when I when I seen this, I was like, damn. Um, because you know, shout out to um to, to Flo Anthony. Um, you know, they 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 have been you know dealing with each other for a, a while now. And um she was actually gonna I I worked with her in the past on a television show. So she was actually the one that was gonna put everything together for us to get the interview, but we wound up having to leave, so we couldn't get it. And then, you know, tragedy happens. But I want to send my condolences. Um, to, to to Leon Spinks, you know, definitely yeah. did his thing in, in in the boxing world for for a long time. Well, he's he's the only man to beat Muhammad Ali for a championship. Um, the the family itself is is a boxing family. His brother Michael Spinks was also a heavyweight champion. Um, his his nephew Corey Spinks was a middleweight champion. So it's a lot of you know a lot of legendary boxing within the family. So our thoughts and prayers go out to him, man. And um. It's, since we're on the snow, I got to say this too, man. Thoughts and prayers go out to Pedro Gomez's family, the reporter from ESPN who yes. passed away yesterday. Uh, as a Latino male, he's, he's somebody I've watched closely through his, his baseball interviews and telecast. So when I saw the news, I was a little shocked, man, because he was so young. He was only in his mid-50s. Man, man. man we take, we take, we take in, man, so many losses that we take in. We're losing a lot, a lot of our, our greats, man. Um, so just, just condolences. Um, I definitely, you know, just, just to everyone, please be safe. If you outside, put your mask on, just, you know, just got to go back to this Corona stuff because, you know, in the, within the past two years between COVID and just everything else that's been going on, we have lost so many people. So please do the right thing. If you guys are outside moving around, please mask up, man. Please disinfect yourself, your clothes. When you come in this, inside the house, you got elderly people, you got kids, disinfect your clothes, alcohol, you know, light soil, whatever, whatever it takes, man, because I, I'm I'm tired of losing people at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm tired of hearing, you know, every if, every week we get on, you know what I'm saying? We we lost somebody else. I'm tired of having to, to, to make those announcements. So please, you know, guys, just be safe. Absolutely. Um I know we got to get up out of here, but let me quickly shout out the sponsors 
uh, Soundview Liquors, Peachtree Home Services, Kmart, and of course the Rosado Firm. Thank you guys as always uh, for supporting Real Fans Real Talk. Make sure you guys are following us on the web on all our social media, facebook.com forward slash Real Fans Real Talk. Um, Twitter, Instagram is at Real Fan Talk. Um, and subscribe to that YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash For the Fans Productions. Um, for all of you guys that watch from New York City, you guys know we're on 8 p.m. Thursday nights on Verizon 43. But for anyone who is not in the New York City area, do not worry. All you have to do is go to realfansrealtalk.com Thursday night. Click that link right on the homepage. And you guys can watch the show every week right along with everybody else at the same exact time from 8 to 9 p.m. Um, Eric, you want to give us a final thought? Yeah, absolutely. I know we uh, touched on it earlier, man, but our thoughts and prayers go out to that young lady who was fighting for her life that was involved in an accident um, with Andy Reid's son, man. She's very young girl. She's five years old, man. So no child deserves to have to go through that. And we hope and, and pray for her speedy recovery. That's a fact. That's that. Oh, man, that's, see, I, I got hit. Yeah, I know. I know. But we, you know, it was on my mind too, man. Like, yo, you know, that's, that's a young woman. That's, that's a young yeah. girl, man. That's fighting for her life, man. And, and she's definitely in our thoughts and prayers. That's a fact. So with that being said, make sure you guys have subscribed to all of our affiliate podcasts, uh, shooting the shit. Sanchez Show, Real Fans, Real Talk Podcast. You can get them on all the major streaming platforms, Apple, Spotify, Art Radio, all of that stuff. So make sure you guys are subscribed. Just keep tuning in, because guess what? We ain't going nowhere. That's <laughs> I, a fact. My man, Uncle, Uncle Ralph said it best when he did a drop for us. He said, they ain't going nowhere. And guess what? <laughs> we still ain't going nowhere. We right here. We're going to continue to, to be the best sports news and talk television show and podcast. <laughs> out there man so for myself trip young and my brother legend in two games get out of here man peace uh-huh this is real fans real talk real fans real talk we as real as you thought real fans real talk we the illest of course real fans real talk we the illest of course real fans Real talk, we as real as you thought Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam High in demand, so please stand by if you can What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie in your plans On court, talk of sports through the eyes of the fans With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez You heard what I said, we elite Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in you gotta watch, this show is one of a kind Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9 For the older folks or even if you younger No matter what sport, this show, we got it covered It's filmed live in the middle of BK So ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays What's up guys, I'm Emerald Marie And be sure to check us out on the web at realfansrealtalk.com